Hello, Tom Levecchia here with a special edition of the Armchair NBA. In collaboration with the new Mobsters, Inc. I just recently wrapped up my interview with Salvo Riena, which is known as Riena Jr., which is the son of Tutorina. I did a post on my community on Armchair and shared it with Ar uh, Mobsters, Inc., and said, hey, listen, this is a big interview. It's his first ever U.S. interview. And I kind of gauge how many people needed maybe a primer, uh, maybe didn't know Totorina, or needed to be a little bit more educated. 22% resp uh, percent responded that, hey, you know what? Please do um, a, um, a, a show on it, kind of giving a primer. Quick shout out to Johnny. How are you? Big G, how are you? Your sauce is coming. I didn't make it to the store. It's on my to-do list. Stay tuned. But um, we're going to do um, a collaboration with Luxury Drop today. So I'm going to put a link below for those that are catching it secondarily. Please give them a sub. I wrote to them respectfully and asked for them to use uh, their video because they encapsulated the story of the rise and fall of Totorina perfectly. So they said I can use it. I'm going to be using it as commentary is fair use. But I do have their written approval. That's how you're supposed to do it, guys. If you're going to use somebody's video, get their written consent, even when you think it's fair use. So let's jump right into the rise and fall of who we know as the beast, Toto Arena. Okay, let me just share this for a moment. As people are coming in, but let's get it underway again. Johnny and uh, Big G, super happy to have you here. So we'll jump right in. The video is all about a man who rose from poverty to become Sicily's most powerful man, a ruthless, power-hungry thug who, despite his humble beginnings, was able to outmaneuver the other mafia bosses and seize leadership of the biggest gang in the country. Watch the video till the end as we tell you all the details about Totorina, the Sicilian boss of bosses. Okay, give them a sub, love, luxury drop. We will uh, put a link below. And in this video, I'll send a link to this video. Put a, a comment there that the armchair sent you. Okay, so Totodina was born very poor in Corleone, Sicily. I got Don Corleone here. He's helped me out today. And I uh, was born in Corleone, Sic Sicily. Um, very, very poor, which I think helped model some of his behavior later in life. The beginnings. Totorina was born on November 16th, 1930, in a rundown country house in Corleone, in the province of Palermo. Rina's father, Giovanni, found an unexploded American bomb in September 1943 and attempted to open it to sell the powder and metal, but instead set it off, killing himself and Rina's seven-year-old brother, Francesco. I, um, I uh, said this yesterday in a live stream uh, in Italy. I had an uncle named Francesco, who his job was to detonate landmines that were left over from the war, uh, accidentally blew one off, actually died. It was my father's brother, so it kind of resonated with me that his brother's name was Francesco as well. And wounding his other brother, Gaetano, after the death of... Now, Gaetano is now doing life in prison. We'll get to him a little bit. His father, Rina, started doing criminal activities and was caught by the police in 1949 and was sentenced to 12 years in jail for killing Domenico Di Matteo in a fight. After his early release from prison in 1956, Rina joined Luciano Leggio, Legio was okay, so this is important. Luciano Leggio is considered to be, I believe, and, and considered by many to be the architect of the modern day Cosa Nostra. So, if you guys remember back in the 30s, Cesare Mori and the Iron Prefect almost uh, eradicated the Sicilian mob. Um, and then uh, Luciano Leggio made it a point to um, make Corleone the powerhouse. Uh, he was very powerful himself. He was an upcoming guy. He was younger at the time, uh, and he just wanted to take over. And he was Gumbare with Totorina, Bernardo Provenzano, and Lico Luca Bagadello. We'll get to that in a second. It was a brutal 33-year-old who ordered the killing of Michelle Navarro. Okay, Miguel Navarro is very important. He was a doctor. He actually was a physician. 
Um, and as a physician, um, he was a mobster. He was, um, he was a mobster. He was, uh, uh, the guy in Corleone, he was a Don, if you will. And it was kind of a difference at that point of kind of changing the old guard to the new guard, old rules to the new rules. Kind of like when Gotti killed Castellano here in the States. The head of the mafia family in Corleone. After Navarra's death, Leggio became the new boss in 1958 and began to strengthen the Corleonesi with the help of Rina, Calogero Bagarella, and Bernardo. Pro okay, so Bagarella is another legacy mafioso, very important, and Bernardo Provenzano. So you're talking, I said this yesterday, you're talking like, you know, Kobe Bryant, you know, Michael Jordan, Magic Johnson, and Larry Bird lining up just to take over and run shit. Provenzano who were all involved in the murder of Michelle Navarra. After police investigation into the case of Navarra, arrest warrants were issued against Leggio, Rina, and Provenzano, and they were forced to flee the country in early 1960. They spent the following few years tracking down and killing scores of Navarra's surviving adherents. In 1969, Rina and Leggio were captured and prosecuted for murders they committed a decade ago. However, as the jurors and witnesses were intimidated by them, they were acquitted from the case. After being indicted on a new murder accusation later that year, Rina fled into hiding and remained a fugitive for the next 23. Yeah, so 1970, that's when he fled, which was really critical because he was considered a ghost for up to 23 years. Years. But Leggio was caught and imprisoned in 1974, again for the murder of Navarra in 1958. Rina was now the Corleonesi's leader, notwithstanding Leggio's influence from behind. Yeah, Leggio is still calling the shots. Behind bar. So or at least... At least uh, in the beginning. Brendan, you're not fat. Hold on, no, we got a sure. commercial. Let me skip this. Look at Nate. He's the Mafia War. Rina started the second Mafia War. Yeah, the first Mafia War was really bad. They blew up like a police station. Um, and then uh, Rina wound up starting the second Mafia War, which was uh, a big turning point in the history of uh, Sicilian Cosa Nostra. Or between 1981 and 1983 killing Corleonesi's main opponents, Stefano Bontade and Salvatore Inzerino. Okay, so this is really critical. So the Coppola, or the commission in Sicily, uh, comprised of, I think, five um, of five different uh, uh, heads. Uh, Inzerello, Bontate, I believe, uh, uh, Rina, and then I want to say either people Calo and Miguel Greco. So they had their commission, right? Now, with this where it gets like very Machiavellian, but Tante's brother, believe it or not, wanted to take over and he had issues with his brother. So it's kind of pretty, not easy to kill him, but he killed him. He was a Palermitano boss. So his brother slid in and then eventually kind of got in line with, um, oh, it's Battle Lamente, sorry. Uh, got in line with uh, Rina and the new faction. And Zarella, he just mowed over. He just killed and killed many members of his family. And these guys were really powerful guys, uh, arguably even more powerful than Rina at the time. But he used cunning by got, getting certain alliances to either get people to be double agents, get them to turn, or just use brute force. That's why they called him the beast. And the Inzarello portion of this has major repercussions on American Cosa Nostra, which we'll get to in a little bit. As well as many associates and members of both their mafia and blood families. During this time, Rina and the Corleonesi, along with their friends, demolished and wiped out their enemies, resulting in up to a thousand deaths. By the end of the war, the Corleonesi was effectively the undisputed leap. Yeah, so Battle of Mente got pushed out. He was the big guy near uh, Palermo Airport. He built the airport. He, he was in big on construction. He got pushed out. And then, as you guys know, the Pizza Connection case, that was him. Got the drugs from the Mujanin. We did a separate show on that. Uh, we actually covered that on Mobsters Inc. Check that out. Uh, number two, um, we looked at... Um, uh, uh, Tommaso Buscetta, who was in uh, Brazil at the time, he pretty much wiped out his whole family, his two sons, his brother-in-law, um, I think an uncle and nephew, and he did not want to return. The reason why Rina did that is he wanted him to return and to answer to him, either to use him for his drug connections or just simply kill him. I'm surprised he didn't find him in Brazil. It was just easier to kind of wipe out his own family in Sicily. Again, Tommaso Buscetta also turned, turned out to be a turncoat and um, uh, testified in the Pizza Connection case as well. Leader of Mafia. Over the next few years, Rina extended his power by murdering the Corleonesi's influential friends, such as Filippo Marches, Giuseppe Greco, and Rosario Riccobono. 
And these are major powerhouses in the Sicilian Mafia at the time. Prior to Rina's faction being the island's dominating force, the Sicilian Mafia was based in Palermo, where they controlled huge numbers of votes. Yeah, so uh, you control the politicians, you control the construction contracts, because it's very uh, socialist, uh, socialistic there, if that's a word, but it's a kind of a socialist environment. Um, if you control the, the, the local politicians, the state politicians, province politicians, you control the construction in the area. The Palermitani generally had had that on lock. It also had a higher population concentrated in Palermo, uh, and Palermo was pretty much a powerhouse. But Rina was set, dead set, literally, on shifting that power over to Corleone. Allowing them to form mutually beneficial partnerships with local politicians like Palermo mayors Vito Chianzimino and Salvatore Lima. Salvatore Lima or Salvo Lima, he had the contract to collect all the taxes for the state on behalf of the state for Sicily. Big money. Uh, he was in bed with the mob. Chianzimino amassed a great fortune by allowing unrestricted property development on the well-known valley known as Golden Bowl, while Lima gave the mafia a crucial monopoly on tax collection and was instrumental in Rome-based Giulio Andreotti becoming a national... Yeah, Andreotti, which eventually became prime minister, essentially president, had very close ties uh, to Totorina, allegedly, um, and their power uh, yielded all the way to Rome. ...political force. These ties led others to believe Rina had formed similar ties with Andreotti, despite the fact that the courts cleared Andreotti of mafia ties after 19... <coughs> Bullshit. ...eighty. These rumors were strengthened when Rina allegedly met with then Prime Minister Andreotti in Salvo's home and greeted him with a kiss of honor. However, all of this was completely denied by an. So fat. Brendan, you're not fat. Yes, I know. I need a hair blocker. Look at me. Andreotti. The year of assassinations. Rina now, this is where it gets crazy. Rina was a fully vicious and bloodthirsty boss. In an attempt to intimidate the government, he ordered the murders of judges, police officers, and prosecutors. On April 30th, 1982, the well-known La Torre was assassinated. And in response, the Italian government dispatched Carlo Alberto Dalla Chiesa, an Italian carabinieri general, to Sicily in May 1982 with orders to exterminate the mafia. However, he himself was a... Yeah, so imagine them killing a prominent judge, prosecutors, politicians, and then sending the military in, and then the head of the military gets killed as well. But it gets a little tricky. In Italy, nothing is whatever it's, is what it seems, especially with Sicily, especially with the mafia. Uh, De La Gessia was um, aligned with the Christian Democrats, which kind of had a machizzi with the mafiosi there. But I'll leave it up to you. Assassinated in the city center, along with his wife and driver bodyguard, on September 3rd, 1982. After the general's death, a law named after La Torre was passed in reaction to public outrage over the failure to adequately attack the organization Rina led. This became an all-out war between the authorities and mafia. The yeah, he, like Pablo Escobar, and uh, if you haven't seen it, check out Pablo Escobar's wife interview. Uh, it's on the channel. I'll, if I have a chance, I'll drop a link below for that uh, as well. Um, I can't see the comments too well. That's why I'm looking down. I'll get to the comments, Johnny, in a little bit. Um, so, but Rena was the first to just pretty much take on the actual state, take on the actual government uh, via war. Security agencies were looking for an informant to get the insider news of the mafia to stay one step ahead. The agencies got lucky as they somehow stumbled upon Buscetta. Before him agreeing to become an informant for the agencies, Buscetta, along with his two boys from his first marriage, Benedetto and Antonio, was on the run. While he was hiding, his brother Vincenzo, son-in-law Giuseppe Genova, brother-in-law Pietro, and four nephews all were killed. On October 23rd... Yeah, two sons and those four people. What a shame. 3rd, 1983, Buscetta was arrested in Sao Paulo, Brazil, and extradited to... He actually didn't want to roll in the beginning. He actually consumed uh, some cyanide uh, prior to uh, doing so. And by doing so... Um, uh, he almost died, but then he eventually lived. Italy, on June 28, 1984. It was then that Buscetta requested an interview with anti-mafia judge Giovanni Falcone, and thus began his career as a pentito, a.k.a. an informant. Buscetta was the first high-profile Sicilian mafia... Good movie, by the way. That's a movie called The Traitor. Highly recommend it. ...also to turn informant. He disclosed that the mafia was a single organization led by a commission 
implying that the organization's highest tier was implicated in all of the organization's crimes. In the Maxi trial, Bushita assisted Judge. So, the Maxi trial was was, was, this, yeah, was orchestrated by Falcone, Giovanni Falcone, and Paolo Borsellino. We'll get to them in a second. You probably heard their names and what happened to them. So, the Maxi trial, it was roughly 475 mafiosi who were on trial. I think 330 something were given sentences. Um, and Rena was on the run and was found guilty in absentia. He worked at a deal with Salvo Lima. That to Italy has a very long and arduous uh, uh, repeal process or appeal process, and he tried to get him and many other prom, uh, prom, prominent mafiosi sentences either reduced or discarded. Savalima so either made that promise out of fear or maybe out of hubris, did not come through, and um, that caused a rift between Savalima and Rina, and then obviously between these two um, magistrates that you see here and Borsellino in achieving substantial success in the fight against organized crime, which resulted in the indictment and conviction of 475 months. With the holidays looming, we know your production schedule. Yeah, that was actually my bad. Print. It was 475 convicted, not 300. The bombing of train. This is really bad. In an so, so I'll let it, I'll let it speak. Attempt to divert investigative resources away from Buscetta's crucial disclosures. Rina planned a terrorist-style atrocity in the shape of the Train 904 bombing on December 23, 1984. As a result of this, 17 people were murdered and 267 were injured. So at the time, people thought it was uh, uh, dissident terrorist groups within Italy. This was dubbed the Christmas Massacre at the time and was initially blamed on political fanatics. However, it wasn't until several years later when authorities discovered explosives similar to those used in Train 904 while searching Giuseppe Calo's hideout, that it became clear that the mafia was behind the attack. After all the... Yeah, so that was um, how they found out. They found the similar uh, explosives in a mafioso raid, and that's how they, they were able to pin it back to uh, Cosa Nostra. Investigation and evidence, Rina was given two life sentences in absentia as part of the Maxi trial. Consequently, Rina put his faith in the lengthy appeals procedure, which had repeatedly resulted in the release of convicted mafiosi, and he put a stop to the killings of officials while the cases were being heard by higher courts. Yeah, he actually, if you notice that span, obviously in the 80s, um, there was a lot going on in the maxi trial, I think it was 85, 86, and, and went on for a while. Uh, but there was a lull in the high profile bombings and killings after the 904. That was his kind of like, and he did a few other ones as well, which we'll get into. He was kind of his appetizer to say, hey, if you mess with me, here's what's going to happen, right? And number two, he was banking on Salvo, Salvo Lima's um, power brokering, if you will, to make sure the repeals go away. However, once the decision came against Totorina, it was no stopping him as he went on a killing spree. Killing of judges. After the convictions were upheld by the Supreme Court of Cassation in January 1992, the Council of Top Managers, led by Rina, retaliated by ordering the death of Salvatore Lima and Giovanni Falcone. So you wind up killing Lima um, pretty much right away. Again, we don't know if Lima overextended himself, bullshitted, got maybe uh, a politician promised something that they couldn't do. Whatever reason, that resulted in Lima getting killed and then these two important magistrates. Falcone, along with his wife Francesca Morvillo, and three police officers were killed in the Capazzi bombing on the A-29 near Palermo. Look at all that destruction. I mean, you're talking, you know, like a thousand pounds of explosives detonated. Like, it left a crater. Um, when I went to Sicily, I made it a point to drive, you know, drive by, stop, and, like, to this day, you just still feel the, like, the... The 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 the, the, uh, the vibrations, if you will, um, it just it's insane when this happened. I remember when this happened. I was um, uh, I went to Italy. I think the following year. Then I wound up going to Sicily about four years later, and I visited that. And I also visit visited uh, Paolo Borsellino's house on May twenty third, nineteen ninety two. Whereas Borsellino was murdered along with they blew up him, uh, uh, Borsellino, visiting his mother in his house in the front of his house. And um, the explosives were so great that at the time, and I don't know how it is now, they still had the burns from the bomb that went up, I think, about seven or eight um, different floors. 
and it was crazy. Uh, killed him, I believe his mother and uh, bodyguards and members of his family. And, and just so you guys know, Borsellino was Falcone's mentor. So not only did he kill Falcone, but he also killed his mentor, Borsellino. Five police officers near the entrance to his mother's apartment yeah. block in Via D'Amelio by a vehicle bomb two months later. It was quite clear that Rina was the one who ordered both attacks. Furthermore, Rina also didn't spare Ignazio Salvo, who had cautioned Rina against shooting Falcone. The arrest. Understandably, the people were enraged, both at the mafia and at politicians who they believed had failed to protect Falcone and Borsellino. In response, the Italian government organized a huge crackdown on the mafia. Balduccio Di Maggio, an ambitious mafioso who had deserted his wife and children for a mistress, assisted with the authorities after learning that Rina would order the execution of subordinates he deemed untrustworthy. So um, if you watch Rina's, uh, so in Italy, you're allowed to confront your accuser. There's many tapes of Rina speaking publicly in court, um, and he talks a lot about having a nuclear family, being faithful to your wife, and uh, basically was roasting Ms., um, Tommaso Buscetta because he was a, a kind of a player and multiple wives and so forth. Um, so interesting enough is, although he was a killer and massacred hundreds, not thousands of people, um, he had a moral code when it came to his home life. DiMaggio identified Rina's wife at the entrance to a complex of villas where a wealthy businessman who worked as Rina's driver was living. After that, the authorities kept an eye on that house and captured Rina at his Palermo house. I don't know, by I think uh, Provenzano made the call, but that just me. House on the 15th of January, 1993. After the apprehension of Rina, a series of terror acts were authorized as a message to the group's members not to testify. On May 14th, 1993, Television anchor Maurizio Costanzo, who had expressed joy at Rina's arrest, was nearly killed by a bomb while driving down a Rome street. This was the first of a sequence of explosions. This was followed by a bomb under the Florence Torre del Pucci, now, which killed five. Now, all bombings are a big deal. If one life is taken, it's a big deal, and I don't want to discount it in any way. But also in Italy, it's not like the U.S. These, these structures have been around for thousands of years. And, and aside for the loss of life, which is, again, incalculable, um, some of the artifacts, some of the architecture, some of the structure, some of the culture just was reversed in a day based off these bombings. People and badly injured more than 30 others. The mafia also damaged art galleries and churches with attacks that killed at least 10 people and injured a number of others. Giovanni Brusca, who was one of Rina's hit guys, a piece of shit, men who personally detonated the device that murdered Falcone was now also arrested in 1996. Rina was sentenced to 26 life sentences in prison and was placed in solitary confinement. Rina was imprisoned under the Article 41 BISC prison system, which imposes strict security restrictions on mafiosos with the goal of isolating them from conducting crimes through his organization from within prison. However, Rina's bloodthirst persisted even while he was detained. He ordered the killing of a 13-year-old boy in order to threaten his father, who was about to testify against him. Consequently, the boy's body was found strangled and dissolved in acid. After his capture, Rina's assets were completely seized, which amounted to 125 million U.S. dollars. 125 million back then. And his vast residence was purchased by the crusading anti-mafia mayor of Corleone in 1997. After that, the mansion was turned into a police station, which opened in 2015. In 1974, Salvatore Rina married Antonietta Bagarella, and the couple had four children. And I talked about the name earlier. Bagarella is another prominent mafioso family. Two sons and two daughters. Giovanni and Gio. That's who I interviewed on my left, and I believe your left as well. It's not reversed, right? Um, and uh, that's Salvo, and that's Giovanni. Seppi, his sons, were imprisoned in the same way as their father. Giovanni, 24, was condemned to life in prison. That's, I think, Salvo. In Palermo, in November 2001, for four murders. While Rina's youngest son, Giuseppe, was sent... I don't know, maybe it's right. The first one is Giovanni, yes, and that's uh, Salvo. Salvo is a little younger. ...sentenced to 14 years in prison on December 31, 2004, for a variety of offenses, including mafia involvement, extortion, and money laundering. Salvo did eight and a half years. He Why Giovanni's in for life was discovered to have set up mafia-controlled companies on the island to hide money from protection rackets, drug trafficking, and tenders for public building projects. While in prison, Rina underwent heart surgery in mid-March 2003, 
and was hospitalized in Ascoli Piceno in May of the same year due to a heart attack. He was hospitalized again for heart difficulties later that September, and in 2006 he was transferred to the Opera Jail in Milan due to cardiac troubles. Rina's lawyers asked the Bologna Surveillance Court in 2017 for the sentence to be deferred to home arrest, citing Rina's frail health. However, the tribunal refused this request. Almost six months later, Rina died in a medically induced coma on November 17, 2017, one day after his 87th birthday. The Mafia boss is still famous for his violence and ruthless nature, which earned him the nickname of The Beast. The boss of bosses is widely regarded as the fiercest and nastiest mobster in history. And that's it for today's video. If you found this video interesting and helpful, then make sure to hit the like button and make sure to subscribe. All right. I want to thank um, the good folks at Luxury Drop. Let's support them uh, by giving uh, them a sub. Let me drop them a link after the show. If you can kindly go in there. Actually, let me drop the video link and tell them the NBA sent you and uh, like, subscribe to that video, as well as give Luxury Drop a sub. They are good, um, uh, good people. Um, so this kind of setting up the interview with um, Salvo. Let me just show you the quick uh, trailer that we launched, if you haven't seen it. So I get chills every time I watch it, <laughs> um, and uh, my editor has it. I'm hoping to put it up. Helen uh, Hansel was able uh, to win. Premiere it early next week. Uh, stay tuned for that. Um, I'm going to go through some comments, any questions that um, I can answer for anybody uh, about Tutorian that I can't answer, and a little bit about Salvo. I'll talk a little bit about the interview, and then we will um, we will conclude. Again, hi, Big G. Hi, Johnny. You know nothing about the mob. Come to Bensonhurst. Um, I know the history. I'm a podcaster. I'll leave it at that. Um, can you try cracking open an unexploded you know, ordinances? Yeah, that's crazy. Need an ad blocker. He doesn't look like Joe Messina. Tom, I made a video from uh, Sidma Anthony Mafia Center in Corleone in August where they hold all the files of the maxi trial taking, uh, taking me forever editing out family, but we'll put on my channel soon. Johnny, send me the link, Tom, in the theater. When you get that, I'll be happy to promote it. Um, Corleone, actually, they gutted the local government. And the reason why they gutted the local government um, was because of Mafia Association. It's actually was taken over by the state. And that was a stunning trial, to say the least. They built a bunker just for it, doing a currently one with the Mancuso family in Italy. Uh, but yeah, and then, and then like the mafioso, they weren't like the most um polished people they were very reverent so we hear screaming yelling um miguel Greco was it miguel Greco? i think it was miguel Greco. like basically threatened the judge to his face he's like i wish you well i hope nothing happens to you <laughs> like it's just crazy shit um so yeah uh nicholas yeah hopefully i'm hopefully you guys are enjoying uh yeah he was the beast uh la bestia but we probably should call him animale um he was not a uh he was not a good person um yeah i don't i don't i don't do as many lives it's funny i'm doing two in two days um just family commitments business commitments i just don't have a lot of times so if you guys think i should do more lives drop some links below and hey throw a super chat while, while you're at it um yeah siciliano um i've been to sicily three times and uh yeah i visited um uh falcone where he blew up or Salino, and i actually went to licata fridi which was uh, where Lucky Luciano was born. Yes, I am a mob nerd. Uh, the highway that killed uh, Falcone, you can't believe how big it was. Yeah, the crater was huge. The crater was huge. It was, it was massive. Buongiorno, Luigi Basilia. Basilia. FBI used the same name under the cover agent later on. The agent was Cuban playing an Italian. I believe he's referring to Jack Garcia. I spoke to Jack in the past. I'd love to get him on the podcast. Peterstown, email me, brother. Tom, a new theory. We got to set up that dinner at Costa's ASAP. Um, 
And I think you're half an Ibn essay, right? You have half LA, it's half an Ibn essay. I don't give you away. But there's a lot of Ibn essay, which is Ribera uh, in from Elizabeth. So good, good, good man, Peterstown. Very good man. Rena was a devil. Yeah, a lot of people believe that. Suffer from gas and bloating. Okay. Um, hey, John, how are you? But I haven't talked to you in a while. A uh, great show. I've been watching. Couldn't come until now. Looking forward to upcoming interview. Yes, it's dropping shortly. Uh, Johnny, thank you. Big Boy Blue, only 10 people watching, but you only have 32,000 subs. Um, we um, we have, well, we have, we're broadcasting on three different channels. Um, and on the mob, that's you're on the Mobsters channel, I believe. The Mobsters channel, I basically have not done many lives. The way the algorithm works, you really have to keep doing lives to get more people to push it, push it out. And um, on the Mobsters channel, very few people watch it live. Um, and I did a few of them. And again, I have George who works with me. We kind of let Mobsters Inc. sit for a little bit. We, um, um, we submitted uh, an application for the trademark. So we have that cooking. I did some interviews on there. We got rejected by monetization. So the low representation on lives from Mobsters Inc. is because we don't do a lot of lives. If I start doing lives every day, or start doing lives more often, it helps the algorithm and it'll be pushed out more. People are not used to lives from Mobsters Inc., even from Armchair. That's why I really don't do as well historically with lives. Uh, very cool. Looking forward to that one. Yeah, it'll be, it'll be released shortly. Who will the guest be? Uh, is that his son? Don't know much about the mob in Italy. Yeah, so, so Squall, Squally, the reason why I did this today, so this will give you a primer. If you missed it, watch it from the beginning or watch the luxury drop link. Uh, it gives you a good primer. Uh, on Totorina, which was an important figure and probably one of the most important mafioso uh, bosses in history, in history of the world, not just Italy, but in the world. And I interviewed Salvo Arena, who's called Bina Jr., his first ever U.S. interview, as far as I know. He only did one interview on um, Porta Porta, which is a big show in Italy. That's it. And then this is his first ever U.S. interview. It's, um, it's respectfully, it's a, it's a big event. It's a big event. And um, this is a setup interview, we call it, a foundational interview. Um, what we agreed to is questions about him and his father and his life on the run. And then we have a second interview scheduled to talk about the book when um, it goes live. Oh, well, excellent. Email me, Tom, a new theory. Tell Nicole I said hello if you go again before me. Um, and I uh, would love to meet you there. Lakata Fili, just a couple of towns away from where his father's side is from Chimina was there a month ago, beautiful town, very beautiful. That's a great area. I haven't been to Chimina, I don't think. Is Rena's son still living in Sicily? No, he lives, I believe, I believe in Padua. When I first had the opportunity to do the interview, um, I uh, <laughs> sometimes I don't think. Uh, I claim to be smart, but sometimes I don't think. And my first reaction was, hey, can I go to Italy if I were to pay the freight? To sit down with him in person and interview and that was completely out of question for security reasons and i'm like can we meet in the uk can we meet you know wasn't happening and then i kind of asked for him to come to new york that wasn't happening so um he, he, i don't know where he lives i believe he lives in padua um i don't know if it's his location is public i believe it is um i don't want I, you know i i'm not going to talk about it. i agree not to talk about it. you can just google him publicly if he was an initiated member and all that kind of stuff you can look that up but what i obviously can't confirm is our, we did interview him, or I did interview him, and um, he was he was a gentleman on the podcast to me. Thank you, Bill. I really appreciate it. It is live, Tommy. Um, I'll drop a link if somebody wants to pop on. I would love other people's opinion. Um, you know, I'm going to stay on for probably another five ten minutes. Yes, this is live. Any advice? Who want going to jail for five months? Um, well, I can only kind of give you financial advice um, and, and and business advice. I would make sure everything is lined up in terms of paid off and then if you stuck with that electrical bill set up elect set up monthly payments make sure your finances are good um i do do people reach out for financial advice for people that got jammed up or served time people's credit tends to get um demolished people tend to let things go it's an obviously emotional and critical time um so i would um make sure you look at your bills now get rid of everything obviously you don't need and then in those five months, whatever you have to pay, um, um, you know, have it on um, recurring. I know this is obvious, but a lot of people don't do it. And then in other cases, you'd be surprised if you just tell people, hey, listen, I'm going to jail. Can you pause whatever I need to pause? I know I'm in contract. Can you pick it back up? And some will work with you. 
Um, and I know it sounds corny and it's obvious, but a lot of people that I do know that were out of jail ask me for advice and I give them that advice. So well, why didn't I think of that? So I'm not, I'm not qualified to give any other advice other than financial or, or business advice on that. Uh, but I appreciate you asking and good luck to you. Good luck. Um, oh, uh, wow. Nice work. Very interesting. Thank you, Christopher. I really appreciate it. His son lives a normal life. Um, well, he, um, did eight and a half years. He wrote the book. I wouldn't. I wouldn't qualify it as normal. I don't think. I don't think if um, you can be totally in the sun and and just live, you know, completely normal normal life. Hey, time. We'll get to you in a second. Boss made advice. Spend five months in jail. Get the time over with. Be polite in there. Mind your own business. When you get out, don't ever go back again. What kind Mr. of jail, Count? Mr. What kind of jail, Count? Hello, sir. Know. How are you? Hey, boss man. If you, I don't know what kind of jail. If it's state, federal, county. I don't it's county. It should be county. Is it in Jersey, New York? You know, I don't know. Uh, whatever boss man, I guess, is willing to share. How are you, Tommy? Good. I'm good. I'm good. How are you? I'm loving your content, man. Loving yeah. your content. Thank you. I this is exactly it. the way to approach it, pal. You're doing fantastic. I, I appreciate it. Well, as you saw, we kind of changed the scope a little bit. We, yeah. We, so, so we kind of said, okay, you know what? I, um, hold on. Um, you skipped, uh, sorry, Xavier. I, I love you, Xavier. You know, I never skip you on purpose. Um, did, uh, did you talk about total upbringing life? Uh, I just missed the live. Yes. So, uh, go back from the beginning when this is over, if you don't mind, and, or I'll put a luxury drop video and it's just basically total in this kind of rise and fall. I'm doing this as a setup because, you know, we interviewed or I interviewed, um, Sal Arena, but yeah, Tommy, we're doing some cool things. So, so what I'm strapped for time, most people kind of know that know me, know my life. I have. Four, four beautiful children. I got a beautiful young wife. I have four oh commitments. So just, just life is in the way, you know. I, I get stuck out for that cigar yesterday because my wife went to, you know, shopping. That's the only reason why, right? So, so busy, so I snuck out. But my point being is, um, we realized that we have a really strong library, and like we're like, well, wait a second. Over a year, we did some really cool interviews. So we're doing the short videos of stuff that people are checking out, and like, oh shit, I didn't realize you interviewed so and so, right? And those are doing really well the short okay. the short i saw them and i was wondering what what they were right because i saw them in in the past obviously i've been here for a while for a while yes. so i saw all of them so i was saying where is this coming from is this something new okay now i know i got you know, it that's what it's like, the idea is it new is it old I like it. yeah here's the, here's the thing Link. Uh, here's the thing tommy and you've been a great supporter and i you know i always yeah. appreciate you but like i've done so many interviews and almost like to the point of like, wait a second, like the Judge Gleason interview on its own would be like a big deal or the, which I want to really, the Chad Marks interview would be a big deal or the obviously Sammy video, the Escobar wife video, the right. uh, uh, Larry Mazza video, like any individually are like, wow, wait a second. Like those are pretty good interviews, right? The whole, the point being is that there's so many that there was like, it came out so fast and so quick that like nine and a half out of 10 people that sub to the channel are like, holy shit, I didn't realize you interviewed so-and-so. That's a great piece. Let me go back and watch that. Or the people that watched the first one, it's a nice reminder to say, oh shit, let me watch that again. Um, and then number two is um, the subs have grown. We're going to hit 15,000, hopefully by Monday. God, there's a lot of new crazy. people. Tommy, there's a lot of new people. Oh so God, uh, in the crazy. last two months, we got about 2,200 new subs. So for those guys have no clue, they might have picked us up from the Escobar interview or from the Sammy interview or from one of the old Panisi interviews. So when they come back in, I want them to point them to the old stuff. So this is for the new and old people, and it's working out uh, uh, really, really well. Um, and um, we're, we're approaching 600,000 views for the month. Um, and again, we're approaching 15,000 subs. And this is without the Salvo interview. Now, remember, the reason why I kind of did the Escobar interview and the Salvo interview only 6% of people in the world speak English as a primary language. And as a secondary language, uh, it's 10%, right? But people consume their content in their primary language. So we did the Escobar interview in Spanish with subtitles. We did the uh, Rena interview all in Italian. So we're going to have an all Italian version with English subtitles. And then we're going to have an English version of me speaking English and him getting a voiceover for the iTunes people and the people that just like to listen. So we're stepping it the fuck up. Yeah. Wow. Like, oh my God. Yeah. Let me make an observation. I'm going to make an observation. Please. I think 
when all the drama shit was going on is where you might have gotten lost in the shuffle. Agreed. Agreed. Now you're out of that. You're on your own. Agreed. You're going to be one of the standalones. You're in a league by yourself. Pat, so that goes without saying. But And your content is professional. It's on point. You don't have a side. You do what you do as your job. You're out. Once you're out of the drama and you stay on your topics, this is why you're going where you're going right now. Thank That's you. just an observation from somebody that saw it from inception to trash to where it, we are, where a lot of people are right now. I, I, I agree. And um, we're approaching the year anniversary of the Armchair Show specifically. Oh, it's, my God. It's uh, soon. And in the year... A lot was done, right? A lot, and, yes. and I'm going to do a year anniversary show. You're going to be invited on. We have a lot of special guests. And um, what I want to talk about is the, the NBA Buttman podcast ended very abruptly. And yeah. I kind of was like a rudderless boat at the time. You know what I mean? It's like, do I yes. do the interviews I already just did? Because, uh, like, you know, people just saw that. Do I do new interviews? Do I do monologue? What do I do? And, you know, there was this kind of space of creators that I thought was a community. And I deep dived into that community. And the truth is, like you said, I um, I got mixed in with the wrong situations right. that just don't exactly. fit me. And um, and, uh, and yeah. meanwhile, I'm creating great content, but the great content was kind of lost. lost. lost you know what I mean? Lost. As a follower forever since I met you. Yeah. Lost. And now, you know, that dust clears. You don't entertain it. You do your thing. So I guess, yeah, you were in that limbo for a quick minute. There was a genre well, around. I would say three to four months. I would own it. I would say three to four months, a good yeah. 103 days where I was in, like, purgatory. And, and, then, and then, then, I, then don't get me wrong. It actually probably took me, like, let's just say I rolled in the mud for three months, right? It took me about nine months to get the stink off me. Yes. To be honest. So, like, it had a negative effect even after. Uh, that's why I'm reintroducing the content to new people or old people who maybe were like, whoa, I want to stay away from this guy. So we're doing cool yeah. things. We're working our butts off. Uh, we'll get smarter, not harder. And you're right. Yeah. The second we kind of got away from the nonsense, the, yeah. the, the, the views hockey stick, you know? It's crazy. My little channel, the same thing. One side – like unsubbed and moved away and did my own little thing. I was never into genre, but into drama, I mean, or anything like that. But once I started to just not worry about other shows and just do what I do, you know, my little thing. And, yeah. I, and then it just started growing from there. It's very odd. I think, I don't know anything about this, but I think YouTube pumps your stuff out based on some of that with things that you partake in. So they look at you as a whole. Is that a possibility? Well, so what it does is what it does do is um, uh, uh, so when so if you want to hit the algorithm, what's what they call it is you want to be come up as YouTube recommendations, right? And what happens is like when that video was done, it'll recommend another video or it'll be on the side, and that's the algorithm working for you. So if you kind of mix with those channels, then you're most likely going to get recommended from the channel, or your 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 videos may recommend them now. Let's just say, um, I'm just going to make this up. Johnny C Catalano is a Sicilian guy, as I know, and is like a you know mafia buff like I am. And he right. likes mafia content and he watches my show right. in Tutorina. But I mix in with um, Mr. X, who is the creator, or, or she is a creator, uh, Miss X, who's a creator that just roasts everybody every day, right? If it goes to the roast person, it's going to be like, well, I don't really like that that much. So now they might not recommend my videos okay. because they're in that sphere and vice versa. If I kind of hang out with the, the roast channel, it may recommend my video and there's, you know, their content's different than mine and it may be off brand. So I do believe personally that, um, that there is some association with that. That's interesting. Yeah. I, that's the way I see it. That's the way I see it going, man. That's just the way it looks. Once you're out of a certain, you know, if it was political science or construction or whatever it might be, Correct. And you're going back and forth, back and forth. They're confused as where to recommend you to. Correct. And and, I, and I'm, I'm, I'm learning where I'm trying to round out the show a little differently. Um, so I'll give an example. One of the challenges, I never really talked about this, but one of the challenges of NBA and Buttman was uh, John obviously had certain restrictions. So we were, after a while, weren't able to interview people that had, um, you know, that had um, a record, right? Now, 
we're in the mob space. <laughs> like, okay, like that disqualifies 80% of the universe, right? Oh, yeah. And, yeah. And, and so that was one of the challenges. I never really talked about that. I'm going to talk about it in a year episode. But I do think people mm -hmm. need some clarity. Um, yeah. But that was a major challenge, right? And with that, but John's great. His stories were great. We were happy. Things were good. But it's a limitation nevertheless, right? Mm -hmm. So the good thing is when I went on my own, that limitation dissipated and allowed me to create different content. But what I'm trying to do now is I'm not trying to just get the stories of the informants because a lot of these do people do turn out to lie. I'm still going to have to interview informants. It's just name of the How game. Do do? How do you get yeah. the information, right? But Pablo Escobar's wife was a firsthand account of a person who slept next to the most important drug dealer of all time, Sal Rodina, the son of the, you know. So I'm trying to step up the content, and uh, so far yeah. it's working, you know. I think it's working. I think it's great. I think it's great, man. I like the way it's going. I'm happy that you're not involved in any of that shit, man. Thank really. you. And then Joey Molina, um, he's working on a website, yeah. you said, and it's getting always doing. Yeah, we speak every couple of days. He's still working. I guess a website's a big thing to do. I don't know. He, and maybe he didn't know what it's like to, to make a website. If it came to us, we could. My company could have did it in a week. If they're if he's not happy with them, steer yeah. my way. We'll we'll work with you guys. That's what we do for a living. So he's uh, he's. It looks like he's obligated to a firm in California. Oh, I know. I, 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 we do the same thing. If you start with us, you got to finish with us. But some of these companies. Yeah. So. So it might be a little more difficult than anticipated. And also, he is launching a podcast at the same time. Oh, he is? So he's going to put all of this together. This is not mob stuff. Um, you know, this is uh, his new know, business venture, right? Yeah. And I'm actually recommending Vinny to be part of his team. That's awesome. Coming up with, hand coming up with handicaps. So I'm going to talk well, to Vinny, Joe. Uh, Vinny thing. has a background. Yeah, yeah. 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 Now, nobody's, per nobody's perfect at this game, right? At this gambling game. But... It all, it's all based on research, opinions, you know, you know the whole, you know how it goes. Well, two so, things I learned about gambling. You got to be right 55% of the time to cover the big. And number two, you don't really bet the games. You bet against the handicap, meaning you try to analyze if it was done correctly versus necessarily the game. You know what I mean? Exactly. So, you work off so we'll, see how, we'll see how it goes. You know, last I spoke to him a few days ago and he says, you know, when I'm ready to launch, we're going to go on your channel. We're going to, we're going to blast it out as a starting point. So you know, awesome. so what's up? Why don't you plug your show a little bit? Let me uh, yeah. let me pull it up there, man. Subs, I'm getting there. Uh, yeah, not enough. I didn't get to a thousand yet. Uh, it's slow, but slow and steady. I'm okay. You know, but I don't promote myself. Is that is that is that stupid? Like I don't go into other shows, drop my link. I never promote myself. I don't know. Is that wrong? Uh, I mean, so here's the thing, because you're not no a no drama channel, so um. You know, like what I what I do is some people like it, some people don't. If I go on other shows, I, mm -hmm. I just don't have a lot of time as I used to. So if I go on other shows, I'm up front. Like, hey, listen, like I'll chat whatever you're chatting about or give input or whatever that is, do an interview. But I'd like to plug my show, you know, like, hey, listen, you know what? Sure. I'm happy to be here before I go. Can you check out my channel? Yeah. If somebody could drop I gotta do that more. And uh, I got to do that more. Just a simple call to action. Yeah. It keeps people engaged. Um, and look at your. I get nine. Listen, I hit 900 yesterday for a minute. I might have gone. I'm looking to get to that thousand as not as a ultimate goal, but it would just feel good, I guess, right? It's, it's a reward nice. for what you do. I'm assuming, it's right? Nice. What, what? You get super chats, you get super stickers. Um, you could yeah. uh, some ad sense if the if the if the views add up. It could be, you know. Listen, why not get compensated for your time? This is a business. Sure. Um, I sure. I personally like I, I I would I would challenge anybody at this level. I've invested. These last yes. 90 days, probably the yeah. for this level, of course, there's bigger shows, but I invested yeah. the most money out of anybody because I really believe in the content. I believe in myself and the brand that I'm yeah. putting out in five figures in money. And, and I, believe, I believe it will return because I believe it's a marathon, not a sprint. That's, That's the way all I you need to do. And yeah, once you, yeah. you know, you should keep pushing forward and not backwards, not get, um, Interrupted with nonsense. That's why you got your eye on the prize, and that's well. Thing. That's why. That's why I'm excited about yeah. Mobster Zinc because Mobster Zinc is when I kind of sort everything out. Is going to be the kind of that that premium premium network for okay. all things like mobsters, mob history, okay. maybe current events, maybe a clothing line, maybe mm -hmm. a show like a different like spinoffs, maybe multiple podcasts within that network. It's it's we have, we have some pretty big plans for it. Um, 
So we bought the and same. And what about armchair? Just more of a variety? So mobsters and mobsters, mobsters, and I, armchair I think, just. I think, I think armchair is still going to do mob content because I that's how we grew the audience. Yeah, but I, I see, like, for example, the Salvo interview is going to be parked here on armchair. But, like, oh. let's just say mobsters is up and running. I probably would yeah. do it on mobsters and do, like, the unpacking or the follow-up on armchair. I want to kind of, like, and I want to open up armchair a little bit to other crime genres mm -hmm. and also some business owners and business advice as oh, well. I'm good. starting that's to good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's nice. Well, all right, buddy. I'm 110 away. I'm getting there. I'm grinding day by day. <laughs> if I get there, I get there. Uh, what, whatever, a little time whatever, whatever I can do to help Tommy, text me soon when we get a cigar. And thanks for coming on. Of course, on, buddy. buddy. Continue well. success, Tom. Thank you. Loving the show. Thank you. All right. So we're going to be wrapping it up. Um, that is the rise and fall special live of Dodarina. Um, the interview with Salvo should be dropping shortly. Uh, stay tuned. I'm hoping this week um, we have some announcements that uh, I said yesterday in the live. We're doing a giveaway with um, Michael Francis. He's going to be speaking uh, November 19th in um, in resorts uh, in Atlantic City. So we're giving away six tickets to that. I'm going to be interviewing Mike, a brief interview next week, uh, and then that's going to support the giveaway. Um, there's a link for the giveaway on the community. Check that out. You just got to put your first name, last name, and email. And then if you win, you pick up your, your tickets at Wool Call. Um, and I said, we're giving away six tickets. For some reason, if you just need one ticket, then we'll parse them off and give them away individually. But we're planning on giving away three sets of, uh, uh, of, of three pairs of tickets or six tickets. I'm interviewing Bill Catolo next week, uh, Junior. Um, so really excited about that. Uh, Tim McBride, who was one of the largest pot smugglers in history. Uh, Lou DeVita, uh, who wrote The Wiser Guy. Then, of course, the Salvo interview um, is going to be dropping shortly. So we have a ton of content coming your way. Uh, Jason, JSV Capital, is going to be hanging out a little bit with us. Uh, he's going to be more involved with the show. Um, I uh, It's a lot for me. So I'm going to be bringing him as kind of a, a, a junior partner on the show. We're going to be launching, relaunching Mobsters, Inc. So we have a lot going on so i just want to thank everybody for uh being here thanking people watching this on the replay um the setup for this is for the sabo arena interview which will be drive uh dropping shortly um if you haven't please check out my interview with pablo escobar's wife uh, i i at the 85 000, 86 000 views only three thousand were from subs i get it's not the mob genre but to you got to watch it to look at her eyes and to see her answers on the man that she loved and the father of her children, the person that she spent essentially most of her life with. She met him when she was 12 and basically married him when he was four, when she was 14, um, you know, who turned out to be one of the most infamous uh, uh, drug dealers of all time. I mean, that, you know, we look at like how cool some of this stuff is, but there's families that are left behind and, you know, just to see that firsthand and to get that close to Pablo Escobar. I kind of had an opportunity through the son or him. I opted for the wife first. My wife knows a lot more about me than my four-month-year-old son. He will know me, and he will know me well. Um, and he'll know me in a different dynamic, but I really felt it was important to get her story first, as well as Salva Lima, the first-ever U.S. interview. Um, just say hello, some hellos before we say goodbye. Hey, uh, uh, BK, how are you, buddy? Nice seeing you. Uh, text me sometime. I haven't heard from you. Thank you so much. Really appreciate the support squad. You've been great in the comments. I uh, really appreciate that. Johnny, as always, really appreciate it. Hit the like button. Thank you, Big Bones. We have to meet for a cigar one of these days. Um, I know you were worried about the number of um, of uh, uh, polls. George goes a little crazy on the polls, but it comes from good intention. It helps jog the algorithm. It helps gets interaction, and it helps with subs. Um, if you haven't subbed already, please sub to the channel, Armchair MBA. Um, we're closing on 15,000 subs, which should hopefully come on Monday. I'm getting called. And then uh, check out Mobsters, Inc. as well. I put some interviews as well. There was a great interview on there with um, Anna Sergi, which I want to uh, unpack. And um, I want to check that out. Oh, my man, Mob and Organized Crime Podcast. A good, good, good in, I think English, right? English bloke. Is that how you say it? Good man, supportive of the show, supportive of me. Um, we did the rise and fall of Totorina. Um, head back to the beginning, if you don't mind. 
partnered with Luxury Drop on this one. They let me use um, their video. We're setting up kind of Toto Arena's life so people understand who he is and the magnitude of who he was. Uh, because we're going to be interviewing, or we did interview, Sal Arena, who is is uh, one of two sons, his younger son or youngest son, his other brother is in jail, and his first ever U.S. interview. I got a feeling it's going to be bigger in the U.K. than it is in, in, in the U.S. initially. But nevertheless, I think um, I think um, it's going to be fun. I think it's going to be fun. So I'm going to I'm going to get back uh, to my family. Um, I appreciate everybody checking it out. If you're watching this, you know if you want to support the channel, you hit the little thanks button. You can give a contribution that way. Uh, any little bit helps. We made a big investment in the show. I'm investing in you guys. I'm investing in this community. We're all part of this community, and I just want to say thank you for each and every one of you for subbing. Uh, for liking, for commenting, uh, even if it's, you don't agree with what I'm doing, for just sharing um, your opinion. Uh, so, uh, I'll, yeah, you got to – I know I know how you operate. Please view it, and if you like it or don't like it, do a show on it because I know you're good at unpacking. So I would love to get your feedback on it. If you would do a show on it, I'll promote it on my channel, and I would love to hear it. Fistful, how are you, my friend? Uh, I haven't – Talk to you as much recently over over um, over uh, commenting, but hopefully you're well. Um, you're probably loving what's going on in Italy. If you haven't seen that, uh, check it out. But I think you're probably loving what you hear there. So, all right, thank you everybody. I really appreciate it, and uh, have yourselves a great day.